Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh And a very good day to whom is my concern I do hope that you and your family had a wonderful, happy and healthy day every day May Allah bless you in the best of iman and taqwa insyaAllah Welcome to all of you to my video My name is Idris Sa'ad This video is made for my series of lecture on the subject of MEC 451 Thermodynamic. Please note that this video is best viewed with the reference to the lecture note that I have provided earlier to all of my students. Also, please note that this subject is specifically for UITM students for the program of EM220, Bachelor of Engineering, Honours Mechanical, and EM221, Bachelor of Mechanical Engineering, Manufacturing, Honours. However, I do welcome anyone who would like to watch to this video to learn something about the thermodynamic that maybe it will benefit your general knowledge. This is video for the lecture of chapter 1, the introduction and fundamental concept of thermodynamic. Basically, this video is for the chapter 1, part 2. In this part 2, I will cover about the system which include the type of the system, properties, state, process and equilibrium in the thermodynamic system. After that, we will... Be Sorry, after that, we will learn about the thermodynamic processes and cycle. Furthermore, this video also will explain about the temperature scale, pressure, millimeter, barometer, and atmospheric pressure. At the end of the video, I will explain about the energy, environment, and sustainability issues. That is for this video. Okay, now let us proceed to the next content. In the previous video, chapter 1, part 1, I have explained about the energy and the law of thermodynamic. For this video, we will continue the lecture with the thermodynamic system, surrounding and boundary. A thermodynamic system is defined as a macroscopic volume in space that can be adequately described by thermodynamic state variable such as temperature, entropy, internal energy, and pressure. In general, it means that any volume in space that can occupy a machine or devices that can perform the thermodynamic processes to change its energy from one form to another or from one place to another. The figure on the left hand side on this slide illustrates the thermodynamic system. As you all can see on that figure, the thermodynamic system consists of three main components. They are a system, a surrounding, as well as a boundary. The system is basically defined as a quality of matter or a region in space which chosen for study. That means it is just a space or a region that we choose to study the thermodynamic system or devices. As for the surrounding, it is defined as the mass or region outside the system and finally, the boundary is known as the real or imaginary surfaces that separate the system from its surrounding. Please note that both system and surrounding are the space, but the boundary is just a surface. Please do remember that. Okay, let us consider the process of boiling water in the kitchen of our respected house in order to understand the difference between system, surrounding, and boundary. Basically, the kitchen can be considered as the system. What is mean here is, in the kitchen, during 
boiling of water, we have to turn on the stove. When the stove is on fire, then the space around the stove become hotter or thermodynamically, the temperature around the stove is increased. Also, after some time, the water start to produce bubble and the water will be boiled. So that the thermodynamic properties such as temperature, pressure, entropy, enthalpy, etc. around that space in the kitchen will change. Therefore, the space in the kitchen is considered as the system. In another word, the system is the space that is affected by a thermodynamic process. During boiling the water in the kitchen, the living area, the garden, the room upstairs, does not affect it. What is mean here is, the temperature, let's say, in the living room, will not increase during the process of boiling water in the kitchen, i.e., the temperature in the living room will not increase. So that, the living area is considered as the surrounding. As a conclusion for the surrounding, the surrounding is actually the space around the system that does not affect it by the thermodynamic process occur in the system. So, we can say that the surrounding and a system are the opposite meaning. One need to be affected, the other need to be not affected. Okay, next, we're looking at the boundary. In general, the boundary is just a surface that separates the system and its surrounding. Basically, there are two types of boundary. If the kitchen and the living room, for an example, during the boiling water earlier, is separated by the brick wall, then the brick wall is the real boundary. Real boundary is normally fixed and we can see and touch it. Next case is, we have a doorway between kitchen and living area so that the surface at the doorway that does not affected by the boiling water in the kitchen is known as the imaginary boundary. The figure of the piston cylinder device of the center on this slide is illustrate the real boundary where we can see and touch the cylinder and that piston. Okay, let us see this figure. So, as you can see, this is the piston cylinder device. This is the uh, surface area or the wall of the piston. And Sorry, this is for the cylinder and this is for the piston. Basically, we can touch the cylinder. We also can touch the piston. So, this is what we call the real boundary. Okay, next. Uh, the figure on the right hand side, which is the schematic diagram of the nozzle, is illustrate the combination of the real and imaginary boundary. Okay, if you can see here, this is the schematic diagram of the nozzle. This is the surface area of the nozzle and this is also the surface area of the nozzle. So, during operation, the fluid will continue flow from that direction. So, in and out of the nozzle. Here, we can draw this particular line is a imaginary boundary. Since this area is constantly uh, allow the fluid to enter the nozzle and this area is consistently allow the fluid leaving the nozzle. So, this is the difference between what we call imaginary and also real boundary. So, the difference between the real and imaginary boundary of the system is whether we can see and touch the boundary or not. If we can touch it, then it is the real boundary. Otherwise, it is the imaginary boundary. 
Okay, so this is basically uh, just what we call the thermodynamic system surrounding and boundary. Okay, now we move on to the type of the system. The thermodynamic system basically can be divided into three types. The first one is the isolated system. The second one is the closed system. And the third one is the open system. Okay, let us discover them one by one. We start with the first system, which is the isolated system. If you can read that one, the isolated system is defined as any thermodynamic system that enclosed by a rigid immovable wall through which neither matter or we also call it as a substance, no energy can pass through its boundary. In general, any isolated system would not allow neither mass no energy cross the selected boundary. Referring to the figure on the left hand side of this slide, it is illustrated that in an, any isolated system, the mass and the energy inside the system could not pass the boundary to go to the surrounding. Similarly, the mass and the energy from the surrounding also could not enter into the system. So, this is what we call the real boundary of the uh, isolated system. So, the mass inside what we call uh, this isolated system could not pass through the boundary. Also, the mass and the energy from the surrounding also could not enter into the system boundary of the isolated system. The real example of the isolated system is the well insulated thermos bottle. Ideally, if we put the hot water into the thermos, the water will remain hot forever. So, this is what we call the example of the thermos. Okay? We put the hot water inside here, so this hot water will remain hot because it could not, the heat and the mass could not get out from this thermos. So that is about the isolated system, and the key word for the isolated system is neither mass nor energy can cross the selected boundary. This is the second type of the thermodynamic system, which is the closed system. By definition, the closed system is any system that can exchange energy in the form of heat and work only, but it could not exchange the substance or matter with its surrounding. Referring to the figure aside, which is the schematic diagram of the closed system, this is the piston cylinder device. As you can see on this figure, all of the boundary are made of the real boundary. So you can see from here, so this is real boundary. So, this is also real boundary. So, everything covered for the closed system is in the real boundary. Therefore, the system is fully closed. Thus, we could not add the mass into the system anymore as well as the mass inside the system could not exit the system. Therefore, the closed system is also known as the control mass system where the mass inside the system will remain there during performing the thermodynamic processes. However, if we put underneath the piston cylinder device that contain of a gas as shown on this slide, so let's say on this slide, okay, sorry, this figure of the piston cylinder device, the heat can be transferred into the gas through the boundary. 
Also, when the gas is hot, it will expand and pushing the piston moving upward. When the piston is moving, it will have the work. From the video of chapter 1 part 2, the heat and work are the energy. Thus, as a conclusion, for the closed system, the mass could not pass the boundary, but the energy in the form of heat and work can pass the system boundary. So, that is the explanation about the closed system. In this slide, I will explain the third thermodynamic system, which is the open system. In contrast with the closed system, an open system is a system that freely exchange energy and matter, or sometimes we call it as a substance, with its surrounding. This figure illustrate the schematic diagram of a typical open system. As you can see on this figure, they are combination of the real boundary and imaginary boundary on this figure. So this is what we call the real boundary. As you can see, the surface of what we call this tank, this is what we call real boundary and this is what we call the imaginary boundary. At the real boundary, the mass could not enter into the system, but at the opening there, where it is separated by the imaginary boundary, so in this area, these two area, the mass can enter and exit from the system. That is mean by the open system. For this course, we will limit the study about the open system up to only for the immovable real boundary. What is mean here is the scope of this subject only limited to the device or component that could not change its size. Look at all the example given in this slide. So this is the first one. Okay, so this is the uh, control volume with a real imaginary boundary for a nozzle. As you can see here, the nozzle, this is the schematic diagram of the nozzle. Okay, so this is the real boundary and uh, this is the imaginary boundary. So during operation, the fluid will flow through the nozzle. But the total volume inside what we call the boundary will remain a chain. Okay, this is number one. Number two, basically, this is the water tank. If you can see the water tank, this is what we call all the real boundary. Okay, the real boundary. However, at this particular position, the water is entered into the system. And this one, the water exit into the system. So, during the operation, the whole size of the tank will remain unchanged. So that what is mean by a control volume. When the device or component could not check its size, then the volume of that particular device or component will remain unchanged or we call it as a fixed value. The mass and energy can freely enter or exit from the opening system or we can say that the mass and energy can pass through the real boundary, uh, sorry, the imaginary boundary at any time. However, the volume must remain constant. So that is mean by the open system and control volume. For the control volume open system, it is usually enclosing with a device that involves the mass flow, such as compressor, turbine, nozzle, or diffuser. Compressor always extracting the atmospheric air and increase the pressure of the air and release the high pressure of air to the other users. The fluid always enter and exit of the compressor. So that is the example of the what we call open system control volume. Okay, now we have finished studying about the thermodynamic system. As a summary, there are three types of thermodynamic system. The first one is the isolated system, which is the important point that we have to understand is 
no mass and energy could exchange between the system and surrounding. Number two is the closed system. It's also known as the control mass system, which is a system that can exchange energy in the form of heat and work only, but not matter or substance with its surrounding. The third system is our open system, or we uh, limit our study up to the control volume only. The open system control volume is actually a system that freely exchange energy and matters or substance with its surrounding, but the volume of the system is remain unchanged during the thermodynamic processes. Okay, uh, in this figure, so basically this is the figure of the schematic diagram of the Rankine cycle that we will learn in a final chapter or chapter 6. As you can see on this diagram, it has four main components. Okay, component number one, so this is what we call component number one, which is pump. And this is component number two, this is, we call it as a boiler. And this is component number three, this is the turbine. And this is component number four, which is the heat exchanger, or in this case, specifically, we call it the cooling tower. Okay, all right. So all of the device is in the open system and control volume condition, but as a whole system, which is operated by using water, it is basically the closed system. Okay, so... If you can see, this is the pump, the water enter here. The size, the size of the pump doesn't change, the water exit here. So this is mass flow, this is open system. Again, for the boiler, okay, the water enter here, exit here. So open system. For the turbine, also what we call here, so uh, water enter here, exit here. And then this is what we call... Also, water enter here, exit here. All of the four components or devices in this what we call Rankine cycle is operated as an open system. However, the water inside what we call the system is remain unchanged. It's just cycle here. So, no, no mass can go out, no mass can go in. So, the system is in the closed system. Uh, however, you can see this is what we call the system that we need to face in the application side of the subject. So, uh, please be prepared yourself to study this type of the system. Next, I will explain to you about the properties of a system. Property is generally defined as any characteristic of a thermodynamic system. As I explained in the video chapter 1, part 1, about the physical quantity, the property is also can be expressed as the combination of a numerical value and its own unit. Some familiar properties are P, pressure, in the unit of KPA, temperature, T, in the unit of degree Celsius or Kelvin, Volume, capital V, in the unit of meter cube, and mass in the unit of uh, kilogram, as we denoted as small m. In the study of the thermodynamic, properties are always divided into two main groups. They are intensive or extensive properties. By definition, the intensive properties are those properties that are independent of or not depend on the mass of the system, such as temperature, pressure, and density. In contrast to the intensive properties, the extensive properties are the properties whose dose value will depend on the size or extent of the system. If you want to know whether any property in the group of intensive or extensive properties, we can divide the system boundary into two equal parts. If we have a similar value after we divided the system boundary, 
then it is the intensive properties. But if we have half value from its original value, after we divide the system boundaries, then it is the extensive properties. Figure aside illustrate how can we identify the intensive or extensive properties. As you can see on the top figure, inside the system boundary, we have mass, volume, temperature, pressure, and density. After that, we divided the system boundary into two equal parts as shown in figure below. As you can see on the bottom figure, the value of the properties after we divided the system boundary, the mass and volume will become half from its original value. Thus, the mass and volume are basically the extensive properties where the value of mass and volume become half after we divided the system boundary. As for the temperature, pressure and also the density, their value remain constant after we divide the system boundary. Hence, the temperature, pressure and density are not depending on the size of the system boundary. So, they are in the category of the intensive properties. So, that is how we can identify any properties, whether it is in the group of intensive or in the group of extensive properties. Uh, in thermodynamic study, we are actually more interested in the intensive properties rather than the extensive properties. So, what we are going to do is, we will convert the extensive properties into intensive properties by dividing the extensive properties into the mass. Or, in another word, we make extensive properties per unit mass. This conversion, which is an extensive properties per unit mass, is also known as a specific property. As you all can see on this slide, the example given here is the volume in the unit of meter cube. Then, when we divided the volume into the mass, it became the specific volume in the unit of meter cube per kilogram. That is how we converted our extensive properties into intensive properties as a specific properties. Other examples are the specific enthalpy, H in the unit of kilojoule per kilogram, specific energy, E in the unit of kilojoule per kilogram, specific internal energy, U in the unit of kilojoule per kilogram, so that the unit of all the specific properties must be per kilogram. Or in another word, if you see any unit that is per kilogram, that is the specific properties. This is actually similar to the price of the fish or a chicken or other thing at the wet market or at the other shop. Normally, the fish or chicken at any particular day was sold with the price per kilogram. Thus, the price is consistent or similar for that particular day. That is very similar to our thermodynamic study. We want uh, our properties at one particular condition to become as consistent as we can. In another word, at one condition, the value of the thermodynamic are constant. That is very important to our study. Next issue that we need to understand is the thermodynamic equilibrium. Basically, the thermodynamic equilibrium is defined as any system that maintains thermal, mechanical, phase, and chemical equilibrium. Maintain the thermal mean the system has uniform or constant temperature. When the system is said maintain mechanical, it means the pressure of the system is constant or uniform. As for the phase equilibrium, the phase of the substance will not change. 
If it in the liquid phase, it will remain in the liquid phase throughout the entire thermodynamic process. If the phase of the water is mixing between ice and liquid water, they are need to be remaining at the same uh, phase throughout the process and finally, the maintaining the chemical equilibrium is when the chemical composition of the substance is remain. For an example, the chemical composition of the water is H2O, then it will remain H2O throughout the entire thermodynamic process. That's what is mean by the thermodynamic equilibrium. Okay, in this slide, I will explain to you all about the state and equilibrium. Actually, the state and equilibrium are used in the thermodynamic study to plot a graph in order to calculate the work done of the thermodynamic system. It is also used to identify the direction of any thermodynamic process. Normally, if we want to plot a graph, the procedure is we need at least two axes, which is the axis X and axis Y. So from that axis, the intersection between the line in the X axis and the Y axis is the point or the position. So that's what we call what we learn in our mathematics. If we have two or more position, then we can draw a line. Similar procedure is happening when we want to plot the graph of thermodynamic processes. However, in thermodynamic, we use the property as the axis and the point or the position on that particular graph is called the state. If we refer to the definition of the state from the thermodynamic point of view, the state is just a set of properties that describe the condition of a system or it is the properties of a system that can be used as coordinate to describe the condition of the system. If the properties of a system change, then its state is also changed. However, the properties that we use to identify the state must be in constant or equilibrium condition. Otherwise, it will keep changing in our graph. So, that what is mean by the state and equilibrium. Equilibrium is defined as the state of balance. In an equilibrium state, there are no unbalanced potential or any driving forces within the system. So that the value of the properties will remain constant. In our study, we have several types of thermodynamic equilibrium such as Number one, the thermal equilibrium, it is uh, defined as if the temperature is the same throughout the entire system. Mechanical equilibrium, when there is no change in the pressure at any point of the system with time. Number three, the phase equilibrium, when a system involves two phases and when the mass of each phase reach an equilibrium level and stay there. Number four, the chemical equilibrium. When if the chemical composition of a system does not change with time, there is no chemical reaction occur. Okay, now let us look at the example of the piston cylinder device given in this slide. At first, or in thermodynamic language, we call it as state one. The properties of the substance inside the piston cylinder device are 2 kg of mass, 20 degrees Celsius of temperature, and 1.5 meter cube of volume. After that, the volume is increased to 2.5 meter cube, while the other properties are remain unchanged. So, now, the value of volume is changed. By referring to the definition of the state above, which is, if any property or properties of a system change, then its state is also changed. 
So now the state becomes state 2, not state 1 anymore. See the value has sorry, since the volume has changed. Based on this condition, we can plot the graph for this process as shown on this slide. So uh, as you can see in the x axis we have the volume. In the y axis we have the mass and in the z axis we have the temperature. So based on the state number one here where the mass is 2 kg, the temperature is 20 degrees Celsius, the volume is 1.5, then we can plot state number one. So when the volume is changing from 1.5 meter cube to uh, 2.5 meter cube, then the state is also changed to state number two. As you can see here, so from here, this is the direction of the process from state one to state two. As you can see here, the volume is moving from the left hand side to the right hand side. So that means the volume is increased. So uh, this is our, about what we call the state and equilibrium. And from this one, basically area underneath the graph is basically the work done of the process. So this is about the state and equilibrium. In order to define the thermodynamic state, we need to follow the rule of state postulate. The state postulate is actually a term that is used in the thermodynamic study that define the given number of properties to a thermodynamic system in a state of equilibrium. It is also sometimes referred to as the state principle. The state postulate allow a finite number of properties to be specified in order to fully describe a state of thermodynamic equilibrium. Once the state postulate is given, the other unspecified property must assume certain value. The number of properties required to fix or to define the state of a system is given by the state postulate as the state of a simple compressible system is completely specified by only two independent intensive properties. That's why in the previous slide, I stress to you that we are more interested in the intensive properties rather than extensive properties. So now, uh, the simple compressible system means if a system involves no electrical, magnetic, gravitational, motion and surface tension effect. So that is mean by the compressible system. What is mean here is we only need to have two independent properties which is the intensive properties to define a thermodynamic step. Sorry, the thermodynamic state. Okay, alright. So as for an example, the properties of the nitrogen inside the piston cylinder device shows in this slide a temperature and specific volume. So both of them are in the group of intensive properties. Therefore, we now can define the state of that nitrogen. Anyhow, in mathematics, we need two axes to define the point. So, same thing is happening in the case of thermodynamic. As a conclusion, if we have two intensive properties, then it is enough to define the thermodynamic state. That is the state postulate. Okay, so far we have learned about the thermodynamic system, which are isolated, closed and open system. We are also have learned about the properties of a system, which are intensive and extensive properties along with the state and equilibrium. Recall that part of the thermodynamic study is about transferring the energy from one position to another position. Thus, now, I will explain to you about the processes and cycles in 
model thermodynamic study. Process is basically defined as any change that a system undergoes from one equilibrium state to another. Referring to page 9 in this video, I have explained to you about the state and equilibrium. As you refer to the properties of a substance in that distance in the device, when the volume is changed, although the temperature and mass are constant, the state is changed. That change is the process. Basically, in the thermodynamic study, we have so many processes in one thermodynamic process as shown in this figure. Okay, so as you can see in this figure, the process is keep changing from one state to another. So this is state number one, this is state number two, this is state number three, this is state number four, number five, number six, and number seven. Interestingly, the change of the state will form a pattern. As you can see here, is clearly we can see this is the pattern or what we call the pattern of the uh, state. That pattern is known as the process path. So this is line, okay, we know it as the process path. In thermodynamic, the process path is known as the series of state through which a system passes during any thermodynamic process. In order to describe a process completely, we need to specify the initial and final state respectively, as well as the path it follows and the interaction with the surrounding. Please remember that in order to specify the state, we need the properties to stay at an equilibrium condition. However, in real thermodynamic process, let's say boiling the water, the heat is always transferred into the water without stopping. Thus, very hard to make all properties in that the water to stay at constant value at any time. So, we could not define the state and thermodynamic analysis could not be done for that particular case if the properties is not stay or the properties is not maintained at one value. Because of that, we are theoretically assume that at one point, there is a position of that property become constant. Please remember that this is just a theoretical assumption. That condition is known as quasi-static or we call it also as quasi-equilibrium process. In scientific explanation, the quasi-static or quasi-equilibrium process is when a process proceeds in a such a manner that the system always remains infinitesimally close to an equilibrium state. It is basically just a slow process that allows the system to adjust itself internally so that properties in one part of the system do not change any faster than those at other part. Therefore, we can take the data on that particular position and plot the graph and eventually we can complete our analysis. That is about the process and cycle. In thermodynamic, the graph that we plotted by employing the thermodynamic properties as coordinate is known as the process diagram. The process diagram is actually very important and they are very useful because we can visualize any thermodynamic process which is a core within the process diagram. Okay, as an example, let us see this piston cylinder device. As you can see, this is the piston cylinder device. Okay, initially, the piston is this position. So, we can define this is state number one. 
so we can record it volume and also we can record its pressure now we put the force at the back of the piston then the piston will move to the left hand side during this process this is what we call the compression process so until this position or we stop here and this is we call it this is state number two so from this one we can also record its volume and we also can record its pressure so now this is the our process diagram so from this one we can plot the graph from state number one goes to state number two from here we can see the direction of the process the volume is reducing while the pressure is increasing so this is how we do our process diagram as for the process diagram okay some common properties that are used as coordinate are basically temperature pressure volume or sometimes we can use the specific volume uh, in thermodynamic we also use the prefix iso uh, in the thermodynamic process the prefix iso is often used to designate a process for which a particular property remain constant or equal for an example if the process has constant temperature then we call it as isothermal process iso is mean constant then thermal is referred to the temperature similarly if we have isobaric process oh sorry isobaric process it is mean uh, the constant pressure process so iso refer to the constant baric is refer to the pressure okay that's what we call the isobaric process uh, however uh, i will explain about the thermodynamic process in detail in the next slide so uh, for now don't worry about it another thermodynamic terminology that you all need to know is the cycle referring back to the compression process on this piston cylinder device so if you can see this piston cylinder device let me clear up a little bit okay so now if you can see if you can see from here so the first process is basically okay uh, the piston is moving here okay so it is compressed so now if you return it back into its position what will happen is so if you plot the graph in our what we call a uh, uh, process diagram graph okay what we have is let me clear this one so this is from state number one it will go to state number two and finally it will return back here so this is this arrow this is this arrow okay so now this is what we call the cycle so in standard definition the cycle is actually a process during in which the initial and final state are identical you see here this is state number one then it's go to state number two and then it return back to state number one so you may have what we call another process so this is state number one it go to state number two it go to state number three it go to state number five it go to state number six it go here go here go here and finally return back to original then this is what we call a cycle okay so um that is about the process and the cycle that we should know and we should understand as i promised on the previous slide now i will explain to you about the type of the thermodynamic processes basically when any of the properties of the system such as temperature pressure volume etc changing the system is said to have undergone a thermodynamic process actually we have various type of thermodynamic processes for now i will explain it briefly to you and the detail about it will be further explained in chapter 3 okay let me go one by one okay the first one is as i briefed earlier is the isothermal process it is a process during which the temperature t remain 
constant. That mean along the thermodynamic process, the temperature of that particular substance did not change or its value is constant. The second one is also have been brief earlier. It is the isobaric process. Okay, so this is isobaric process. It is a process during which the pressure P remain constant. The term baric is basically referred to the pressure because in thermodynamic, we are usually use the unit of bar to define the pressure. For those who don't know, one bar is equal to 100,000 pascal. Okay, number three. Number three is isochoric or isometric process. Okay, isochoric is basically a process during at which the specific volume V is remain constant. Next, number four. Number four is the cyclic process. So, this cyclic process was also have been explained earlier where it is the process when a system at a given initial state goes through various processes and finally return to its initial state. It is actually similar to a process during which the initial and final state are identical. Actually, in the cyclic process, we will have the network of the thermodynamic process which is the enclosed area on the PV diagram of our process diagram as I shown to you in the previous slide. Okay, now we go to number five. Number five, interestingly, this is very interesting. This is what we call the reversible process. Okay, a reversible process is in fact a process that one having taken place it can be reversed. In doing so, it will leave no change in the system or boundary. Actually, there are two important conditions to make the process become reversible. Number one is, it must can be reversed or we can move it forward and backward. And the second one is, this is very important, it must leave no change in the system boundary. Okay, in order to understand this, let us imagine that we walk on the sand on the beach. When we walk forward on the sand, we will have a trace of our footprint going down on the sand. Then, when we are reverse our walking, our footprint will go up as usual as if we had never walked there, like we reversed the movie. Okay? So, if you can do that, then it is only considered a reversible process. If we just walk previously, but our footprint is remained there, then it's not considered as a reversible process. Actually, reversible process is just a theoretical or it is known as an ideal or perfect process. No actual process has a core in reversible process as defined by that. So, the question is, why we could not have actual reversible process? In order to find this answer, please refer to uh, the video chapter 1, part 1. So, please find it. Okay, next, number six. Number six is basically irreversible process. So, irreversible process, if you can read from here, this is what we call a process that cannot return both the system and surrounding to their original condition. Basically, reverse, irreversible process is basically opposite to the reversible process. If we have reversible process in ideal condition, irreversible process basically is the actual condition or the actual thermodynamic process that happened in our, our world. Okay, next we go for the adiabatic process. Okay, it is actually a process that has no heat transfer 
transfer into or out of the system. It can be considered as perfectly insulated system. For an example, so let us consider our air conditioning unit. If you see the outdoor unit of our air conditioning unit in our house, we uh, may see the black color of insulator. That insulation is used to prevent the heat to enter into the air conditioning system between the outdoor and the indoor unit during the operation of our air conditioning system. So, at that particular position, the process is ada fighting. So, the following process is the isentropic process. So, the isentropic process, basically, this is uh, similar to the reversible process. It is defined as the process where the entropy of the fluid will remain constant. So, no change of entropy during this process. So, because the entropy didn't change, so we will call this as isentropy. So, isentropy refer to the entropy. Number 9, we have polytropic process. Okay, the polytropic process. It is defined as when a gas undergoes a reversible process in which there is heat transfer, it is represented with a straight line which follow the equation of PV power of N is equal to constant. Okay, recall your mathematical knowledge. What is the equation of the straight line? The answer is basically Y is equal to Fx plus C. Similarly, any process which have the process path in the process diagram that follow the equation of the curve of PV power of N is equal to C, it is the polytropic process. Then we have to calculate the equation of the curve. So be ready with your mathematical knowledge. Okay, finally we have number 10, the throttling process. So the throttling process by standard definition, it is a process in which there is no change in enthalpy, no work is done, and the process is other biting. So it must have three uh, conditions. The first one, no change in enthalpy. The second one, no work is done. The third one, the process is other biting. If that process can fulfill these three conditions, then it is said to be a throttling process. So, it looks like it's very complicated, isn't it? However, it is very simple. In actual practice, the throttling process is the process of opening and closing of the water tap as we do it in our uh, bathroom or our shower, whatever is it. It's just to turn on and turn off our tap. That's all. You just want to control the flow of the water. So when we control the water, so there is no change in enthalpy, no work is done, and the process is adamitic. So that's what we call, this is the throttling process. Okay, that were 10 thermodynamic process for now. Please memorize and understand all of those 10 thermodynamic process if you really want to pass this subject. So, I wish you a uh, good luck and happy study. Okay, uh, this is slide number 14. Recall that we have three types of energy in transit where they are heat transfer, work transfer, and finally the mass flow. Since we need to record the thermodynamic properties at a constant value, then, for the mass flow, we need to record the data when the mass flow is steady. Thus, in this slide, I will explain to you about the steady flow. Sorry, about the steady flow process for the mass flow. The term steady implies that there is no change with time. What it means here is. At any time of the flow rate, the mass flow is constant. 
let's say you open a tap of water for cleaning processes. During cleaning process, you did not change the flow rate of the water. So, at the time of the cleaning, the flow rate is steady. And we can record the mass flow rate during that time. The opposite of the steady is unsteady or we also call it as transient. By scientific definition, the steady flow process is a process where the fluid properties can change from one point to another in the control volume, but they are remaining the same at any fit point during the whole process. A steady flow process is characterized by the following. No properties within the control volume change with time. That is, mass of the control volume is equal to constant and the energy in the control volume also equal to constant. Also, for the steady flow process, no properties change at the boundaries with the time. Thus, the fluid properties at an inlet or exit will remain the same during the whole process. They can be different at different opens. The heat and work interaction between a steady flow system and its surrounding do not change with time. In order to understand this, let us look at the example in the figure given in this slide. If you compare the temperature at 1 pm within the system boundary given on the top of the figure, you can see that the temperature are not the same. But when the time change to 3 pm, at those particular position, the temperature is remain the same. So, as a conclusion, for a steady flow process, it does not have to be constant value of properties within the all system boundaries. However, we only need to be consistent value at a particular position within a given time frame. So, that is the steady flow process. In actual application, a large number of engineering devices operate for a long period of time under the same condition and they are classified as steady flow devices. Referring to the previous example of the steam power plant in the slide number 6, the pump, boiler, turbine and heat exchanger which is the cooling tower are operated as steady flow devices. Normally, steady flow devices are intended for continuous operation for a long period of time. Please take note of this steady flow process since we will study it in detail in chapter 3 onward. Okay, now we move on to the next topic which is the pressure. So, I will review a little bit about the pressure. Basically, you have learned the pressure in the subject of the fluid mechanic. So, pressure basically is defined as a normal force exerted by a fluid per unit area. So, uh, pressure in thermodynamic, we write it as P. This is equal to force divided by area. So, from force, it comes from Newton. We know it, force is equal to Newton per meter square. So, Newton per meter square is basically, this is defined as a Pascal. So, please remember, Pascal is the name of the person who discover about the pressure. Okay, for the unit combustion, I told you earlier, 1 bar is equal to 100,000 Pascal. So, this is equal to 10 power of 5 Pascal. It's also equal to 0 0.1 megapascal and it's also equal to 100 kilopascal. So, uh, one atmospheric pressure, so we write it as 1 atm. 1 atm means one atmospheric pressure, that means the pressure of our atmosphere. So, it's equal to 101325 pascal. 
So similar to 101.325 kilopascal and this is equal to 1.01325 bar. So uh, basically the rest is the unit of the uh, pressure. So we can convert it into a uh, a pound per centimeter or whatsoever so for our case we use what we call the standard unit which is the pascal and we can convert pascal into bar mega pascal or kilo pascal okay uh, what I would like to emphasize about the pressure is we have three type of pressure they are the absolute pressure the gauge pressure and also the vacuum pressure. The absolute pressure is the actual pressure at any given position. It is measured relative to absolute vacuum, which is at absolute zero pressure. For thermodynamic study, we will use the absolute pressure in our calculation. The gauge pressure is actually the difference between the absolute pressure and the local atmospheric pressure. Most pressure measuring devices are calibrated to read zero in the atmosphere. And so, they are indicated gauge pressure. For an example, if we are pumping air into our car tires or motorcycle tires at a petrol station, we will set it at certain unit of the pressure, whether it is in kilopascal or bar. That pressure is actually the gauge pressure. Finally, the vacuum pressure is the pressure below the atmospheric pressure. For your information, the atmospheric pressure is 101.325 kilopascal as I explained in the previous slide. But sometimes we approximate it at 100 kilopascal. We have to understand that any substance we move from, sorry, uh, we have to understand that any substance will move from high pressure to a low pressure. For an example, when we drink a water through a straw, we need to suck the water. Note that since the water is exposed to the surrounding at atmosphere, then the pressure of the water is one atmospheric pressure. The suction process is the process of creating vacuum pressure in our mouth, which is lower than one atmospheric pressure, so that the water in the cup can flow through your mouth. Common engineering device that use negative pressure is the vacuum cleaner. That's why the vacuum cleaner can suck the dust. The equation given in this slide is the gauge pressure is calculated by absolute pressure minus the atmospheric pressure. Based on this equation, we can write the absolute pressure as a gauge pressure plus the atmospheric pressure. So, this is the gauge pressure is equal to absolute pressure minus the atmospheric pressure. If you want the absolute pressure, so basically this one, you move this one. Okay, so that means this is P, A, T, M plus the gauge pressure. So we can get the absolute pressure. As for the second equation, so this is the second equation. The vacuum pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure minus the absolute pressure. So P, A, T, M minus absolute pressure. So the figure on this slide illustrate the scale of both equation. Please note that. Throughout this course, the pressure which is denoted as capital T will represent the absolute pressure unless specified otherwise. I do hope that you do not confuse with these three types of pressures during our study and especially during your exam. Yes, the pressure comes from the Pascal law. When we apply the pressure to a confined fluid, it will increase the pressure throughout by the same amount. Pressure at point 1 is equal to the pressure at the second point. Then the pressure is F over A as you can see in this equation. Okay, so this is point number 1, pressure 1, this is point number 2. So P1 is equal to F1 over A1. 
So P2 is equal to F2 over A2. So we can uh, manipulate this equation. Okay, F2 over F1 is equal to uh, A2 over A1. So this is what we call the uh, Pascal law. Okay, so basically we can use similar principle to our study. So uh, this is the barometer, a pressure measurement device. Basically, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you will study about the detail of the pressure measurement device in the subject of fluid mechanics. So this is just a review. So please, what we call, consider uh, how you calculate the pressure in the subject of fluid mechanics. Anyhow, based on barometer, the atmospheric pressure is calculated as density times gravity times the height. That's what we are going to use in our subject, what we call thermodynamics. Okay, next, uh, this is also pressure measurement device. So this is a manometer, which is commonly used to measure small and moderate pressure differences. A manometer contains one or more fluid such as mercury, water, alcohol or oil. You may refer to this slide for in detail calculation and in your fluid dynamic subject. Okay, uh, basically uh, we have many pressure measurement device. So as you can see in this slide, the first one we have a uh, burden type. Okay, the burden type uh, pressure measurement device is uh, consists of a hollow metal tube bent like a hook whose end is closed and connect to a dial indicator. So this is burden type. Okay, so... Next, we have what we call pressure transducer. So, you can read one by one. So, we have strain gauge pressure transducer. We have piezoelectric transducer. So, this is basically we have many type of call pressure measurement device. Okay, again, so please refer to the subject of fluid mechanics on how this uh, type of pressure measurement device is operated or the working principle of this pressure measurement device. However, for our study, we just want to, what we call, use the pressure. Okay, uh, now I will explain about the energy and environment. Basically, the conversion of energy from one form to another often affects the environment and the air we breathe in many ways. And thus, the study of energy is not considered completed without considering the impact of energy to on the environment. As for the thermodynamic study, we want the heat energy. It always involves the combustion process. Pollution emitted during the combustion, especially of fossil fuel, are responsible for smoke, acid rain, and also global warming. The environment pollution has reached such high level that it become a serious threat to a vegetation, wildlife, and also human health. That's why we need to consider the environment when we are converting heat energy that involve the combustion process. Okay. In this slide, I will describe about the ozone and smoke. The smoke is actually made up mostly of ground level ozone, O3, but it also contains numerous other chemicals including carbon monoxide, CO, particulate matter such as soot and dust, volatile organic compound, VOCs, such as benzene, butane and other hydrocarbon component. Hydrocarbon and nitrogen oxide react in the presence of sunlight on the hot, calm days to form the ground level ozone. Ozone will irritate our eyes and damage the air sac in the lung where oxygen in carbon dioxide are exchanged, causing eventually hardening of the soft and spongy tissue. It also causes short of breath, wheezing, fatigue, headache, and nausea, 
and also aggravate respiratory problem such as asthma. The other serious pollution in smoke is the carbon monoxide, which is a colorless, odorless, and poisonous gas. The carbon monoxide is mostly emitted by motor vehicle during incomplete combustion. The carbon monoxide will prevent the body organ from getting enough oxygen by binding with the red blood cell that would otherwise carry oxygen. Sometimes it can go very serious that can uh, cause the, the death. So that we need to consider its effect to the environment before we just emit the pollution to our environment. Okay, next topic on the energy and environment is the acid rain. In reality, the sulfur in the combustible fuel react with oxygen to form the sulfur dioxide or chemically is written as SO2, which is an air pollution. The main source of SO2 is the electric power plant that burn high sulfur coal. Motor vehicle also contribute to SO2 emission since gasoline and diesel fuel also contain small amount of sulfur. Then, when combustion occur in the engine, it will form the sulfur dioxide. One motorcycle or a car is no a problem. However, in this world, we have billions of engines burning the fuel at the same time. So, the amount of sulfur dioxide becomes significant. This sulfur dioxide will be released to the atmosphere and occupy the environment. The sulfur dioxide and nitric oxide will react together with the water vapor and other chemical high in the atmosphere in the presence of the sunlight to form sulfuric and nitric acid. The acid form usually dissolve in the suspended water droplet in the cloud or fog. The acid laden droplet, which can be as acidic as a lemon juice, are washed from the air onto the soil by the rain or the snow. This is known as the acid rain. As a result of acid rain, many lakes and rivers in industrial area have become too acidic for fish to grow. Forests in those areas also experience a slow death due to absorbing the acid throughout their leaf, needle, and root. Even marble structure deteriorate due to the acid rain. So, acid rain is also a serious problem to our environment. Uh, this is the greenhouse effect. This is what we call it as the global warming and climate change. For the greenhouse effect, Glass allow the solar radiation to enter freely but block the infrared radiation emitted by the interior surfaces. This causes a rise in the interior temperature as a result of the thermal energy built up in the space such as in our car compartment that we live in in the hot sun. The surface of the earth which warms up during the day as a result of the absorption of the solar energy cool down at night by radiating part of its energy into deep space as infrared radiation. Carbon dioxide, CO2, water vapor and a trace of amount of some other gases such as methane and nitrogen oxide act like a blanket and keep the earth warm at night by blocking the heat radiation from the earth. The result is the global warming. These gases are called greenhouse gases with CO2 being the primary component of that greenhouse gases.
as uh, for the report published in the year 1995, the Earth has already warmed up about 0.5 degrees Celsius during the last century. And they are estimate that the Earth temperature will rise another 2 degrees Celsius by the year to 2100. A rise of this magnitude can cause severe changes in weather pattern with storm and heavy rain and flooding at some part of the drought in other. Major flood due to the melting of ice at the pole, loss of wetland and coastal area due to rising sea level and other negative results. So, we as an engineer need to help to minimize this global warming. This can be done by improve energy efficiency, reduce energy conversion that involve the combustion processes, and also we can use the renewable energy sources such as wind and water energy. So, uh, that's all the main content for the topic of energy and environment. Okay, uh, this is the problem solving technique. Basically, uh, any thermodynamic problem can be easily solved by following the given step below. So, step number one, what we need to do is we need to identify the substance or the working fluid. So, in our subject, ABC451, we will uh, use three types of the working fluid or substance which are water refrigerant and ideal gas so the first thing in order to solve the thermodynamic problem we have to identify the working fluid okay either it is water refrigerant or ideal gas then we need to identify the device use the cycle and the system okay so as we know we have two type of system closed system and open system for the closed system, basically we have two devices. So the first one is basically a piston cylinder device. The second one is what we call rigid tank. For the open system, we have 10 devices. So it is uh, what we call uh, such as nozzle, diffuser, and etc. After that, we need to define the thermodynamic process. I have explained to you, we have 10 thermodynamic process isochoric, isobaric, isochoric, and etc. Then after that, we need to draw the schematic diagram of the device and also the process diagram. So the important thing is the process diagram, as I mentioned to you. So we can use PV diagram, PS diagram, or HS diagram, and whatever diagram. But in our study, the most popular is PV diagram and also TS diagram. Uh, after that, number five, we need to extract the given information in the question or the thermodynamic properties such as what is the temperature, what is the pressure, okay, for the initial and other state. After that, we can make an assumption. The assumption normally we make is uh, we neglect the kinetic and we neglect the potential energy. After that, then we can do our calculation. So... Uh, before we calculate, we defining all the state. Either the state is in the compressed liquid, in the saturated liquid, in the mixture or saturated vapor or superheated region. So basically, this is what we call defining of the state. This is what we call the phase of the substance. So please do remember that our water can change into three phase, uh, three major phase. The first one is solid of ice. The second one is water, and the third one is gas. Okay, so uh, we have to define the state for the uh, phase. Then we need to follow the thermodynamic process and we using the thermodynamic law. Please remember, we have four law, zero law, first law, second law, and third law. And we have to arrange our answer systematically and logical manner. Finally, we need to have a reasoning, verification, and discussion about our result. Okay, so that is the problem solving technique. So normally, if you follow this step, it will make your life easier to solve the thermodynamic problem. So that, uh, good luck to you. Alhamdulillah, thank to Allah, I have finished explaining to you about the thermodynamic system, 
thermodynamic processes and cycle, temperature scale, pressure and energy, environment and sustainability issues. If you have any question regarding to this video, please ask it in our WhatsApp group or in our video conference later. Hopefully, this video will benefit your knowledge about the thermodynamic. So, the last word from me for this video is, I will say that the good thing of this video is come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the bad thing of this video is coming from my own weaknesses. With that, thank you very much and good luck in your study and life. Wassalam.